we're ready to spray fix the piece now and uh, here's some Krylon workable fixative. It's a little windy. Probably give it two coats. And then here we're going to do a second coat. It's really important to do uh, at least two coats with this. Uh, that's the one tricky part <coughs> about using the graphite pencil. Uh, it has to be fully spray fixed or else if, if the terpenoid hits that, it can be really bad. So, But spray fixing it is the remedy. And then, so after spray fixing it multiple times, sometimes even three times, letting a few minutes between each, uh, you know, I try to try to smudge it basically. Actually, try to smudge it. If it still smudges, then you definitely need another coat, and you need to wait more time between between uh, coats for it to dry. But at the moment, we're good. And I saw in, in Dean Keller's uh, Dean G Keller's uh, still life. Uh, painting a still life video. He does something similar to this, He, um, but he uses a uh, vine charcoal and then sprays it with the same Krylon workable fixative. And then the test is that he tries to smudge it. So, <clears throat> so we're ready to hit a few dark notes. Um, and really, I'm just looking at, I think I'm just gonna paint this part first. Um, I always recommend to look through, this is the greatest tool, this simply a, find a piece of, uh, black paper, hole punch, and when you look through there, you see a specific color, and color is a hue-value chroma combination. Obviously, it's very dark. And pretty soon, you know, I'm going to start to find the color that goes here to get that, that relation. But just for a few minutes, I'm just going to spend some time mixing that specific hue value chroma. Kind of a combination of ivory black, some of the blues, I've got ultramarine and Prussian. But the main thing is whatever color I mix up in any spot, it only has one place on the canvas. Cannot be used in two different places. So even if I'm going from this to this, from here to here, I'm assuming they're different. And I wouldn't, I would resist the temptation to just take this and put this up here too. I'm not going to do that. But obviously it's so early in the painting that, you know, this is all I'm dealing with is just wondering about this color in this spot. I mean, when I look through, look at it through here, I mean, it's a black shirt, but that doesn't just mean you just use ivory black and that's it. 
it really has kind of a bluish kind of, I find that using the ultramarine and a little bit of this uh, lizard and crimson permanent seems to be about the right, the, the right color. When I sort of glance at it in spots, it almost seems warm, so I'm kind of pushing it with the, the alizarin and crimson permanent, which is called anthroquinone red in uh, the M gram. It's an M gram. I'll talk about all these colors too. But it's kind of like you just worry about, you know, what it, whatever it is that's needed at that moment. And this is it, even if this takes however long this takes. But pretty soon I'm going to move up to here. And then this part of the hat, the dark shadow of the hat. I can do a quick uh, rundown on these uh, colors here. I mean, I feel like this is a fairly limited palette. I feel like this is pretty much all the colors I would need for this painting. Might use a green. But I'll add that. Um, but as you can see, the palette's laid out from light to dark. So there's your values. Everything, everything. If you take a picture, black and white picture of this, each one should look darker than the previous. Um, as you go from uh, left to right, almost like the keys of a piano. Like it's laid out just like the musical instrument, the same way, precisely every time. So um, this is lead white. Rublev's Lead White, M. Graham's Cad Yellow Light, not Cad Yellow, but Cad Yellow Light, which is the, it looks almost looks warm in this video, but uh, it's a very cool uh, yellow, actually. Uh, yellow Ochre by M. Graham, Gold Ochre by Rembrandt, Cad Red Light by uh, M. Graham, Indian Red by Rembrandt, uh, Anthroquinone Red by M. Graham, it's also called the Lizard and Crimson Permanent in other brands. Ultramarine Blue Red Shade by Rublev, which is by Natural Pigments, so this blue and the white are made by the same company. They use, don't use any additives. Prussian Blue by M. Graham, and Ivory Black by M. Graham. Yeah, so I'm not feeling rushed, I'm just dealing with uh, whatever it is that needs to be dealt with right at this moment which happens to be the darkest dark in the picture. And this canvas texture has a certain, it has a lot of texture to it, so uh, naturally it lends itself to building it up, which will become more, more of an issue. And I'm not, whatever I'm doing, I'm not doing this where I start to put it over here or up here or something. Every area of the canvas is entitled to its own unique hue value chroma combination. Just like there's never been two snowflakes in the whole history of the earth that have ever been the same. So I'm starting to feel a little more like it might be time soon to get something for the background in this area. I'm not assuming it's the same over there. So maybe let's try that. Before doing that, I want to make sure I clean the brush. I have my uh, um, the metal can here with the silicoil in it. Let me bring that up. Do you see that? The silicoil. <clears throat> Basically just rubbing it against it, running it against it will clean the brush. Only necessary when you're like really changing colors significantly. But I never use it to paint with. Only this uh, Chelsea uh, 
it's this Chelsea um, Classical Studio uh, Walnut Oil, Extra Pale. They make a variety of things, but I found this one works perfectly. And it's just walnut oil. So again, I don't know, I don't know what color is there. When I look through here, I get more of a, I take it out of context of the picture. Not that that's the only way to conceive of it, but it gives you like another chance to look at it by itself. I mean, it's just kind of an ochre olive kind of color. With some ivory black, the white will come into play. But it has kind of a warmth to it, so naturally I'm kind of reaching for some warmer colors, the reds. I love using broken color. I, I heard that first from Daniel Green. When I, I used to go to his, he used to do demos all the time. He sadly has passed on, but um, he mentioned that, and then I saw it in Brackman's work. Well, he was a student of Brackman, and I think I, I think I understand what it does. It keeps you kind of thinking of things too soon. I mean, that'll be later, going from big to small in general, but um, keeps you more like thinking of just uh, basically sensation of light that your eye is perceiving and that the, uh, whether or not it actually becomes something is a result of placing, placing the correct color in the right spot. You know, starting it away, usually starting the big color masses away from one another and then bringing them in close usually is more successful. But I think only because, again, it keeps you from just thinking of describing things. And as always, you never want to uh, look at anything too long. You almost want to, when you're looking at the whatever it is you're painting, the subject, uh, pretend you're looking at the sun. So you can only look at it for a second. Yeah, I mean, the, I was gonna mention uh, Daniel Green. He never, he never in his demos. I never heard him say why he did broken color and maybe he, he did say that to students he just said that he used broken color but i really think it's just to kind of it keeps keeps the artist on 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 the on his toes you're always searching for the right hue value chroma but it's never just one solid color in one big area So 
So I think I'm going to get uh, some of the notes of the uh, hat brim, the shadow of the hat brim, just to kind of activate this area up here. I got, a, I got a little bit of the background going over on this side too. Again, don't assume that this side and that side are the same in terms of hue value chroma. So I'm going to kind of use the colors that are already on here though, but I mean, I'm going to adjust them. You don't have to, you're not always obligated to like mix up a whole new color from scratch. It's more of just like you're always going back to the palette to adjust if you're changing an area, if you're going for a di different area. And just, you know, to get more info, kind of want to look through it through there. Oh, it's awfully, it is actually awfully similar to that color. It's kind of a very dark, sort of leaning purple. You might expect the shadows to have a warmth to them anyway, because usually it's like a cool light, warm shadow situation if you're working in natural light. So it's nice to have that note up there. And that'll only help when you get the shadow of the um, hat, hat brim is creating on the forehead. Because obviously that has to be lighter. The, the great thing about getting your darkest dark in is um, if you do find your darkest dark, that means everything after that has to be lighter than that, what you just mixed. So it gives you like an order to things. Now I think it might make sense to kind of paint some more uh, background color in there. And definitely one more area I want to get going uh, today before before finishing today um, would be up here. And you'd think it would just be the same color, but I just want to kind of always be on my toes about changing things. So again, hue is um, hue is where is it on the color wheel? You can't just say, oh, it's red, or it's blue, or it's yellow. In fact, there's no such thing. Um, there are only greenish blues, or reddish blues. And as far as reds, there's only orange reds, or violet reds. And with the yellows, there's only greenish yellows, or um, orange yellows. It would be impossible to get what, get it. Right, right in the middle. Anyway, that's hue. And then you have to couple that with uh, what is the value. The value is just how light or dark it is. So there's two variables. But then the third one is... Sometimes gives people more trouble. But it's the chroma. Also known as the saturation or the intensity. Those are usually the best uh, synonyms for that. But that just means how far from gray it is. So you could have a color on the same exact value line 
It could be totally gray or getting more and more colorful and put more and more and more colorful until it's, you know, like that cad red light, for example. So you can imagine this uh, cad red light or take a black and white picture of it and whatever that value is, that would be your, your uh, chroma extreme one way or the other. So those three variables will give you all 20 million colors that the human eye can see. If you actually no one knows how many colors the human eye can see. If you go online, you get sometimes they say 100 million, sometimes they say less than 20 million, but it's in the millions. Just those three, three combinations of categories. Now you have to obviously try to, if that is your goal, to be able to paint, let's say, uh, well, virtually all 20 million. You, know, you set up a palette uh, that will essentially give you that. If I find if I can't get a certain color, it's always because it's a little too chromatic. So I have another uh, violet I like to put in called Quinacridone Rose sometimes that will get me that really like pink violet uh, that, uh, I mean, if somebody were wearing a shirt like that, for example.